Thank you. Thank you all for coming and also I know you're all here for the samosa. <laughs> Listen to me. So we'll just do a little comic relief. Um, and um, so Microgrids Partnership is the title of our presentation. And so this is sort of my beginning slide for many of the presentations I give. Uh, it's life, liberty, and happiness, pursuit of happiness, and the Bill of Rights, and, um, and there are internal processes that we think about internally what we can do to be happy. That's like Richie Davidson's world. And then um, we talk about stuff that uh, we work with external processes. What is outside here to make us happy? And then there's physical environment is so, all you know, heating, cooling, air conditioning, shirts, pants, all that stuff. And then there's cultural environment, which is what you all focus on, the humanitarian side of things, and, and poetry, and art, all this stuff. So in this picture here, the engineers sort of immediate the fulfillment of human needs through continuous innovation in the physical environment side, as well as also internal physiological processes, biomedical stuff, everything goes on. So I want to sort of frame that here, why I'm here, and what we're going to talk about. Uh, let's see how many engineers are in the audience. Mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of engineers. Yeah, there you go. Social engineers. Right? Um, so you probably don't get to hear from engineers that much. So bear with me. So most of still taste the same. <laughs> and uh, this is an older slide, but it talks about human development as ecological footprint. Um, amount of um, global hectares per capita. Uh, plotted against uh, human development, and this measure includes literacy, infant mortality, um, um, what else? Uh, all that stuff. That stuff right? Access to clean water and, um, and your uh, life expectancy, all those things. So there are people who do measure this uh, um, very carefully by doing surveys around the world and uh, plot against the amount of uh, ecological footprint they have, amount of uh, energy they're using, how much of materials they're using, etc. And they come plot against each other, and USA is up here, a lot of ecological footprint and very high level of development. And then Sierra Leone is right here, low level of ecological footprint and low level of de development. And Cuba is out here, high level of uh, human development, but also low ecological footprint. If I had a choice, I would try to put every country inside this box. But I'm not Fidel Castro, and I'm not Elon Musk or anybody either. <laughs> so we want to see what we can do within the scope of our day, life, day job. And this is looking at energy use energy consumption kilogram of oil equivalent per, per person per year uh, for different countries and looking at only one of the measures that are inside the human development and you can pretty much pick any of the measures in human life expectancy and you'll find a graph like this very similar there's a knee around here and then it goes up uh, so I think about energy consumption as a proxy for health, state of health, people, economy, whatnot. And we want to try to see low levels of consumption, can we do high levels of uh, human development? And so now we talk a little bit of a, another tangent here. We look at mobile phone users per population in different countries of the world, different regions of the world. And uh, let's see how many people here in this room do not have a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. You want to maybe, raise your hand? Maybe except the speaker. You want to raise your hand? <laughs> <laughs> maybe except the speaker. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then we see this high level of uh, use, and this is an older slide. Um, India and China, what percentage of number of mobile phone users are there? So if you look at penetration of this technology of mobile phones in playing a role in 
development indices, because of communications, very many other enabling things, it has been very successful for the last couple of decades. And, but if you look at the amount of money that people are spending towards mobile phones, um, disposable, these are for different countries in Africa, you look at disposable income they have on hand, how much they're spending on mobile phones. Look at Ivory Coast, $12 per person, disposable income is $21. Mm -hmm. oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And these markets are big, and mobile phone, and you, this is the same story in pretty much many countries. People use a lot of money <coughs> to be able to communicate. And the premise is that the other item is you look at fixed light access, and probably many of the people in this room don't even know what a fixed line is or a landline is. And um, when I was growing up in India, our entire neighborhood had maybe three or four mobile phone or landline phones. So you have to go to their house and get permission to use their phone. If only if you're a doctor or a lawyer or a well-connected politician, you'll get a phone. And then even then you'll have to wait for five, six years. And that's what the fixed line technology was. And you look at, the, in many of these countries, the amount of fixed lines per 100 in inhabitants is still a very small fraction. And this development happened because the, the, the uh, revolution in this, technology, in, this, in this access to communication technology happened because of technology. Engineers working on it and business is taking up that technology and implementing it. So in my mind, if this life, liberty, and happiness is a human right, it's our job to get energy access to people. If telephone engineers have made it, what are electrical energy engineers doing? What are sanitation engineers doing? They're just slacking off. <laughs> and so we got to make that happen. And the top-down approaches will not take us there. In this fixed line access, World Banks, the United Nations, have given a amount of money Peace Corps students will work on to bring phone access to people. And the country will not be able to pay back the loan. And they get into a loan trap, uh, a debt trap. So this top-down approaches of international development, uh, IPCC reports, all of that is not going to work. It's people who have to make changes. Engineers, business people, common people who are doing their day jobs. We'll have to see what can I do within the scope of my day job to make this happen. And so that's sort of the premise I want to think about. And this electricity paradigm. Today you think about electricity coming in. Everybody call it centralized generation. I call it remote generation. The power generation plant is so far away, nobody wants it in their backyard because it's emitting so much of stuff that you don't want to breathe. And it's very highly regulated revenue process. You know, we don't know where the money is going, why they set the rates, etc. And it's very traded at the bulk utility level and very large customers. Retail price, we don't have. You know, last year we had a big debate here in this town when MGE, and, uh, MGE stayed, changed their rate structures. Very top down, how the grid operates. All we know is turn the switch on and off. We have really no connection between demand and supply and all those things. But to operate the system, the supply and demand has to be matched within a short interval of time. It means the amount of generation has to be equal to the amount of consumption. And this has to be balanced within a few milliseconds. Otherwise, you'll have a blackout, like we had, I don't know, some of you may remember, a couple of decades ago. Um, in parts of the country going down. I mean, there was one in India very recently. So this loss of system interconnectivity requires days and weeks to bring it back together. Um, so it's a big challenge the way we're operating, and it's very expensive. And so we've been working on a different type of paradigm for a couple of decades now. If I can get this thing to work, and I'll go here. Um, so in growing markets like India, there's a very large gap between supply and demand. Anybody who has traveled in India will know electricity is the current is not there. Virtually night, you know, right? 
Italy is never there. And the infrastructure is just bursting, it seems. People want energy, but we can't keep up. And investments are not adequate. You know, Modi can come and get investments from here and there, but it's still in, inadequate. And the operational arrangements are very challenging. Uh, free energy for water pumping before the elections, after the elections. Uh, it's very challenging environments to work with. And responsibility centers are very uncertain. There's so much inefficiency everywhere. They call it non-technical losses uh, for stolen electricity. It's very rampant. Uh, so this just does not work uh, to reach the people. And if you look at unserved markets, like huge parts of Africa, as well as in India, there's an absence in demand. People don't know what to do with electricity. And you want to bring in and say, okay, hey, your development is going to be better if you bring electricity, right? The infrastructure is very primitive. You know, we have some students who are working in Africa. Just to, they, you know, there's a big now international project of putting a generator in a trailer and then taking it to the village and running a generator. Just taking the trailer and pulling it on a truck <coughs> to go from place to places takes three months because the roads are not there. Uh, so there are very challenging things uh, that come about because of this primitive infrastructure. And the economic territory is un unfamiliar. You put money in, are you going to get money back? And the investment models are very inefficient. Uh, most of the time, you don't get the money back. Uh, and the operational arrangements are challenging here, too. And uh, you know, right now, there are elections going on in some country. Which party is going to win is going to affect what's going to happen. Um, so, the microgrid partnership we started last year here with um, some funding from um, Baldwin Grant is to try to see if we can develop a technology for starting an electric utility from scratch very small. And you can use solar biofuel technologies. And you operate this using cell phones that everybody seems to want, and they have. Uh, and they'll pay for it using mobile phones, e-commerce. And we'll train local people to operate it, just like the cell phone industry has done. And this approach is not new. You know, nationwide, there's a big national report that came, <coughs> came out. This is one of the top 10 enabling technology for sustainable global development. You go to any university, you know, the big universities that are doing international work, you'll find some microgrid-related work, Stanford, Harvard, Columbia, you'll find them there. So we're also in that part, part right now, in that bin. But we've been working on this for 15 years, uh, in developing this technology, because we understand a lot of things that others don't. So we developed, started this partnership, UW Madison, we are a leader in microgrid technology. We got a Wisconsin Aggie Baldwin grant last year, and it's matched by National Science Foundation and a few other sources. And at NIE, it started with, I spent a sabbatical residency uh, at NIE uh, two year, year and a half ago. And then we got leadership uh, buy-in from NIE, um, you know, principal uh, Shaker is here and the board, Mr. Shilgo is here. And then our immediate host there is person I work with on a day to day basis there is the Center for uh, Renewable Energy and Sustainable Technologies with Shamsunda. And he has an established engineering outreach network uh, in the area in Karnataka, in other states as well. So from here, we're trying to reach there. Okay. So I'm going to invite Shamsunda to continue about the Center for Renewable Energy and Sustainable Technologies at Crest, and then we'll, Lee will come and sort of wrap it around on what we're actually doing on the ground. The laser works. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. The laser works, but not the clicker. The clicker works sometimes. Yeah, it's it's hard to on your synergy level. <laughs> So good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for the opportunity um, by all of you here. And uh, I will continue where uh, the queue given by uh, Giri. So thanks to all the initiatives of Giri. Uh, 
we were able to carry forward our objectives of meeting the energy needs of our country. Through our center crest, uh, we have, no, it doesn't work. Uh, we are humbly working on technologies which are relevant to our region. We come from south part of India. We are from Mysore. Mysore now we call it as Mysuru. And uh, it's uh, famous for its own way because we have a 10 day festival event there. The Mysore Palace is one of the most beautiful in the world. And it's also an historical city. So in this area, we are working on technologies which can meet the energy demands for local people using local resources. As you know, renewable energy is one of the most abundant uh, resource available on the earth. And we in the south of India, we are blessed with so much of the solar energy and also biofuels because we are agriculture based uh, uh, country. So using these two energy sources, we at uh, NIE Crest are involved basically on uh, using the biomass sources to convert into biogas and also the biofuels, that's the biodiesel which can substitute the regular diesel. We also work on solar energy technologies which can harness the local solar energy which is around 5 kilowatt hours per meter square per day. Rainwater harvesting because the groundwater is very much depleting throughout the world now. Because of the human exploitation, more in what water has been removed. That's also the case in our region in Mysore. So we are giving our technical intervention to see that the groundwater is recharged and we are able to cater the agriculture needs. Sustainable building materials. You know the building material is one of the fast depleting resource on the earth today. We don't have sand to construct uh, buildings in uh, our region. We, we have, we make use of cement which uses so much of energy to make itself available. But there are so many other local materials like mud, bamboo, which are so much traditional and which we have used for generations and centuries. And that even in the Mayanjadara civilization, they used mud with a two-story building. Um, so this we are doing and renewable energy based microgrid thanks to Giri and also the Wisconsin uh, University uh, where we have been introduced to this technology where we are integrating all these uh, uh, technologies to get the needs. So what are we basically doing? One of our uh, basic uh, technologies which can reach our people and also use the resource is converting organic waste to energy. There is a huge amount of organic waste available even in US. Uh, the per capita organic waste, the waste generation is so high. Mysore with a population of uh, 10 like this 1 million, we have 400 tons of organic waste every day, not every year. And Bangalore has uh, 10 times more population, 10 million. And they are generating 4000 tons of waste every day. And this has, we are promoting bifurcating this waste, the organic and the all the non-biodegradable waste. We are converting this organic waste to biogas by a process called anaerobic digestion. That is without uh, the interruption of air and also sunlight, we have biogas generated in small biogas units. As Giri was talking, we are working on decentralized energy system, not a centralized energy system. Every house will have a biogas plant. This is my house. On the rooftop I have kept this plant and all the waste, <coughs> organic waste goes to this and we get biogas which is used for cooking and the slurry coming out is an excellent menu. So this can be an energy source and also remove the waste. This is from our college campus hostel where we have done the biogas plant and all the waste from the hostel campus goes to this, whatever leftover organic waste converts into biogas. This is one of the technology we are integrating also to the microgrid now. So this is my house where I put the biogas plant, the solar panels, rainwater harvesting and also the solar cooker. 
So the waste goes here and the biogas generated is used for cooking. The slurry coming out of this is stored here and it goes to my uh, kitchen garden. We grow organically the food on the, uh, in the kitchen garden which is a very fantastic idea of growing our own food. Mm -hmm. And that can be done with the waste available. And this can go up to the level of automation and to tell you LPG, the liquid, liquid petroleum gas is uh, given at ration. We cannot have more than 8 in a year uh, because there is a policy. But for me to my home only 4 is enough. Uh, because I substitute lot of the energy requirement from the waste that is generated in the home. This is our college uh, campus canteen running on the biogas which is also generated from the food waste. So whatever maybe the food waste left today can be put to our plant and get the uh, biogas for cooking. Slurry goes as an excellent menu. I, I, I tell you the vegetables are very good, organic and very, very uh, health friendly. So we can grow our own food. That way we can also solve the problem of food. And also water. We need not have to give extra water for this. The water coming from the biogas plant itself is a manure and also the water. So this is one of the sustainable technologies which we are promoting locally which works. And we have to use it. Now we are working on biofuels. There is another area of biodiesel. We have local seeds that is grown from the plant. This, this uh, tree is called Pongamia. It is available even in our campus. There are so many trees available. This tree gives a seed. You can see the seed here. We uh, crack this is like a nut. This is non-edible. I am not using a ground nut uh, to make a biodiesel. I am using something which is not edible. So because there is a challenge of food and also energy. What you want? Whether you want food, you want energy, you have to decide. So now this energy is coming from this non-edible oil. We convert it into biodiesel and this is substituting the regular diesel. You know India doesn't have much of the oil resource. We are importing it from other countries and so much of foreign exchange is happening. So that can be reduced by using this as an energy source. So these are the various stages. We have the seed, we have the seed cake and this is an excellent organic manure that can be used to the plants. And we are using it. It's also in good uh, pesticide also uh, that can be used. I think uh, uh, agriculture uh, scientists here he can uh, uh, watch. When I say Karan, that this is an, I am also trying it on my agricultural field. And this oil we are converting into diesel and we are running the vehicles. And government of India has now made a policy to substitute five percent uh, of the diesel with biodiesel. We have a plant here at our institute. And the next one is rainwater harvesting. So. Take the water, filter it, store it and use. Even we have done it at our Mysore Palace. This is our famous Mysore Palace. You are all welcome to visit it. <laughs> so, and here, just below the ground, we are able to store 101 crore liter of water. I mean 100,000 liters of water uh, every year and use it and also for the garden. And in each house, we are having very simple filters. This is filter which will filter the water, store it and use. This is recharge uh, pits uh, or open tanks we call which can harvest the water. These are all the need of the hour. Now we are working on technologies to make building using mud. They are mud blocks. No more cement blocks. You take the mud, compress it, cure it, sun dry it and use it. So a house, we did projects in our forest area, in the tribal area. These houses are built with mud and uh, it is having rainwater harvesting. It is having solar energy, fuel efficient cook stoves. You can see a rainwater harvesting system, and the entire unit is self sufficient. And the carbon footprint is very, very low. And this was done with a very nominal cost, uh, not much of the energy needed, not much of the resource needed. Mm -hmm. So, this is our fuel efficient cook stoves because traditionally in our temples, temples you may be knowing, we cook uh, the food, the prasadam we call uh, laddu. We make, even today they are using wood uh, because they can't forego with that. So now in our Chamundi hill, there is a hill in Mysore, they were spending around 500 kilograms of wood every day. Now using our fuel efficient uh, cook stoves, we are reducing it to 250 uh, kilograms every day. So 50% saving in wood, 50% saving in pollution. One kg of wood can give around 2 to 3 kilograms of carbon dioxide. 
So that is there and the carbon footprint same. So now coming to the last of my uh, few slides. Um, as Giri proposed, Giri came to us and he, he started seeing what all activities we are doing. The work we are doing on energy, it is uh, through biomass, biofuels and rainwater. His, uh, his uh, plan was, why don't we integrate these technologies? <coughs> anyway we are doing it, let us give a communication uh, layer on it, let us give intelligence to this and let us integrate it, let us make the system more reliable. So then we started understanding his concept. His concept was uh, for the requirement of a remote, you know many of our uh, villages are remote, connecting the power line is so expensive. There will be some 50 houses in our tribal uh, localities in the forest, bringing the power line all is so expensive and also time consuming if some failure happens. Nobody is there to manage it. So now this one, will, if this is a village, it creates a small microgrid with our technologies what we are using. We are using solar, we are using biofuel, we are using energy from the water we are using, energy from the wind we are using. Now he suggested that Wisconsin is working on integrating it and giving intelligence on it and making it much more versatile and reliable and that's how today we are in a partnership with uh, uh, your university and uh, NIE or microgrid research and development project. So of course these are the various activities we have uh, to uh, at our center uh, which we basically emphasize on decentralized distributed energy because we don't want it to be centralized and then definitely microgrid will uh, cater to our objective of having a decentralized and uh, distributed uh, energy and also finally uh, a, a sustainable living. So of course we have a lot of outreach programs at our institute. The younger generations are really called uh, to know about these technologies because they learn only things like uh, in nuclear energy or so much of other because India is running on coal. 60% of the energy. We have around 200 and 20,000 megawatts of energy required for India, uh, 220 gigawatts, right now 60% of it is made by coal and it is the most polluter and also the most uh, scam is, uh, is happening in coal because it is a big uh, mafia there. So we have to reduce the dependency of coal. We can prove that it is possible using renewable energy. We can get 60 to 80 percent of the energy can be made by solar and biofuels and to make it more reliable will be our microgrids. So with this I um, <coughs> hand over to Lee to tell more about our microgrid projects. Thank you. Okay, so I had the opportunity um, twice so far, once in uh, this past winter and then over the summer to travel to... We did at the machine and then it'll work. Yeah? No? Nope. That's okay. No bad. Never mind. Um, so I had the opportunity to travel twice to Mysore. Uh, in this most recent time over the summer, actually, um, part of the majority of my travel expense, the, the airfare was paid by the Center for South Asia for a... Um, research grant, travel research grant over the summer. So I'm very thankful for that and also very thankful to NIE and uh, particularly Professor Shamsundar at the Crest Institute for providing me the opportunity to go there and giving me space to work with them and with the other students. Um, so this is the Mysore Palace. So uh, Professor Shamsundar mentioned this, as you can see, it's quite beautiful. I saw it, I showed it without light. You yeah, it. <laughs> so uh, once a week for about an hour they turn on, and I think it's nearly a million light bulbs that are, that are there at the palace. Not just the palace itself, but the surrounding grounds. There's two temples on the grounds and walls surrounding it that are illuminated like this, and it's absolutely spectacular. So if you get the chance, you should definitely go. Um, so. To understand what a microgrid is, first we need to know what a grid is, and as Professor Geary explained, it really is remote generation, because none of us knows where things like this are. I mean, in, in Madison, we've got a couple close by, but centralized generation in the grid has got these massive coal-burning power plants that spew all kinds of pollutants into the air, 
and then these massive wires and distribution networks. So that anybody in the country can stick a house anywhere on this grid and can get connected to power. Um, the statistic for the U.S. is that any, any residential or commercial area, you can build a building and you can get a power connection within a <coughs> week. And that's, that's the average across the country. So now we want to know what is a microgrid? Well, a microgrid is if you imagine taking one of these houses or buildings and adding its own, some of its own energy sources. So it's still a single point of connection within that grid, but now we've got some of our own energy sources, a battery bank for energy storage, maybe it's a single household, maybe it's a collection of buildings and houses, and there's only one point of connection, we call this the point of common connection to the main grid. So now this microgrid can supply all of its own power. If it has excess power, it can push that back to the grid. Or maybe certain times of the day when the sun is not shining, we can draw the excess power that we need from the grid. Or in a lot of cases, and what we're looking at is in India, is we don't need to have a connection to the grid at all. We want to be able to set up a microgrid where there is no grid so that we can supply all of our own power. And again, that could be envision a cabin in the woods that has a microgrid or a community that's too far from the centralized grid, we can supply its own power. So why are, why are microgrids a good thing? What are some of the reasons that we set them up? Well, there's kind of three main categories of benefits to microgrids. As the microgrid owner and operator, you get control over your own power. You get reliability, and you get to use renewable energy if that's something that you have a conviction about using. Um, Microgrids can also be operated in a way, and this is an area of ongoing research, but microgrids can be operated in a way that they improve the stability and reliability of the larger grid. So if more and more people are installing microgrids, there are a number of benefits that can be leveraged for the rest of the grid users as well. And finally, microgrids allow us to use renewable energy sources so that we can reduce carbon emissions and reduce pollution in the rest of the world. So now we want to turn to India and say, well, why are we doing microgrids specifically in India? Why is India such a great place for this collaboration to happen to do this research on microgrids? So here's just a few exemplary countries, and there's a lot of numbers on here, but I want to draw your attention to just a few things. First of all, if we look at Germany and the U.S., there's 100% availability of power. Every single citizen in the U.S. has, and in Germany, has access to electric power. By contrast, in India, this number is about 80%. Now we come over here. Per capita, American citizens are using 14,000 kilowatt hours of electricity compared to, oh, well, see, now it works. <laughs> when I don't want it to. Um, compared to less than 1,000 in India. But you can see this number is growing for India. From 2010 to 2013, it increased nearly 20%. Whereas we see in U.S. and Germany, the number went down by about 3%. The reason that this is going down in the U.S. and Germany is due to improvements in energy efficiency. We're changing from incandescent light bulbs to CFLs and then to LEDs, and appliances are getting more efficient. However, in India, the reason that this is increasing by 20% is that more and more people are getting connected to the grid. More power is being put on the grid and increasing reliability. But even still, you see 14 times a month in India, there were power outages that lasted on average an hour. Whereas in Germany and the US, it was around one, and the outages were less than an hour. So this represents a tremendous opportunity. And even in India, the government is recognizing the fact that that 20% of people that does not have connection to the grid, expanding the centralized grid is not going to be the best way from an economic perspective and from an environmental sustainability perspective. Expanding the grid is not going to be uh, a good way to bring power to the rest of those people. Um, and in a lot of discussion about uh, development of power infrastructure, there's this concept of leapfrogging. So in the U.S., as Professor Geary was explaining, in the U.S., all of us could have access to a landline if we wanted it. When you call up Charter and all you want is Internet, they try to talk you into getting a landline. And no, none of us want it. Um, whereas in India, the statistic I think was around 1% of people currently have access to a landline. So they leapfrogged the U.S. They leapfrogged the developed world. They said, landline is not going to be a technology that's going to have a long-term existence. We're going to skip over that to mobile phones. So India now has the opportunity to skip over the centralized grid. Let's skip from this massive system that we have in Germany and the U.S. and go straight to microgrids. 
and skip spending and wasting all that time and money on infrastructure that's going to be obsolete in a few years anyways. In the U.S., we're shackled with this transmission and distribution infrastructure that's aging and is falling apart. The, uh, the, uh, the blackout that occurred in the Northeast in 2008 was traced back to trees falling on lines in Ohio. And the infrastructure was so cobbled together that a few trees falling down in Ohio was able to bring to, to take power out for millions of people across the U.S. And that was due in large part to an aging infrastructure that was cobbled together. So India can skip past those problems. Um, so a couple, so, so that draws a huge distinction. A lot of this microgrid research is happening in places like the U.S. and India, but our reasons, or sorry, U.S. And, and Germany, our reasons for building microgrids are things like this. We have to. The government tells us we have to use more renewable energy. Um, we want to burn less coal or, or less diesel fuel in generators. And we need to provide backup and energy security, not for the average person who's not going to be affected by one or two hours of power outage once or twice a month, but for things like hospitals, data centers, military bases. But on the other hand, in countries like India, renewables are used because you have to. You have no other option. The, the grid is not there and the grid is not reliable, but the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. Um, and you can't connect to the grid. The, the cost of extending those lines in certain cases is way more than the benefit that you might get just from reducing <coughs> fuel use. And finally, the grid that you do have is so unreliable that having a microgrid is going to improve your own power supply. So now we'll look at uh, what we've actually been doing in this project at Crest. So over the, uh, over the winter last year, we started by setting up wind, solar, and hydropower, integrating all of those things together, and then we had a, a basic, very basic control algorithm to operate those things. Then this past summer, we moved a lot of the, the loads in the Crest office to the microgrid. So now all of the lighting and all of the office equipment is being powered on the microgrid, and we upgraded that control uh, hardware. So now actually it's connected on a network so that from here at UW-Madison, we can check the readings and the measurements and the monitoring of the system there at Crest to run some experiments. The next phase will be happening this winter. We're going to move the remaining Crest loads to, uh, to microgrid supply and also improve that system. Right now, it, it's, um, the battery capacity is somewhat limited, so it doesn't work through the night, so we're going to expand that. Uh, and we're also going to be working in a remote uh, village or hamlet to bring a microgrid power system there. So we'll be setting up the infrastructure for that over the winter, and then the control of that system will be coming in the future. So now, if you'll indulge me, I'll show just a few pictures. Um, so this is the windmill on the roof of Crest. This is the microhydro in their hydrodynamics lab. Uh, and this actually was a project that Professor Geary worked on during his sabbatical there. Then these solar panels are on the roof of a building adjacent to the Crest office. Uh, here's the students. Both times that we went, we did workshops with undergraduate students. Uh, so each time we had about 20 or 30 students. So every morning we would meet with all the students and talk about the tasks that they were going to be working on during the day. And in both cases, and this is one of the things that I found really inspiring, in both cases the students were there on break and they were not receiving any specific type of academic credit. It was a tremendous opportunity, a learning opportunity for them, but there was no academic, specific academic benefit to them. And some of them didn't get to go home because they stayed to work on this project. They didn't get to go home over their break. So here's a number of the students working on the microhydro. There was a tremendous amount of collaboration between the teams. The students were divided into different teams doing different tasks. But whenever somebody was waiting on a part to come in or something to be taken care of, the students would go to the other teams and say, what can we help you with? How can we, how can we help improve your work? Uh, and then we had a little closing ceremony. Here's uh, Principal Shaker here and, and Professor Geary. We had a, a cake for the microgrid, and I think we had a cake for Professor Geary also. <laughs> this was at the end of the, the winter workshop. So then phase two, this is, uh, I traveled by myself this time over the summer. Um, so this is one of the tribal hamlets. There, there are 13, um, and Professor Shamsundar didn't mention this in his talk, but he's working with 13 tribal hamlets that are in a forest preserve to build these Anganwadi? Yes. Anganwadi. So this is a, a building that's made using the traditional construction methods. So there's a kindergarten. Yeah, for a, kin a kindergarten for the, uh, for the people in the community. So there's 13 of them that are being built, 
And we went to visit two of them on this trip as candidate sites for a microgrid. So this is one of them that's being built. So you can see the, the bamboo infrastructure and then the walls are made with mud and then coated with limestone for water, waterproofing. Uh, this is the, the setup that we have in the Crest office. So all of the power supplies come into the, this area here and then you can see the batteries down there. And this is the control infrastructure that we've been working on. So for phase three, when we go back, we're going to, so right now, the, the, some of the students at Crest are working on gathering more data about those 13 <coughs> sites and starting to look into where can we procure batteries and solar panels and, and the aluminum frames and all these things that are going to be necessary to set that up. And here at UW-Madison, we're working on improving that control algorithm and hardware and running some experiments of the system they have at NIE so that when we take it to the remote village, it'll operate seamlessly, or so we hope. Uh, here's a couple other pictures, too, just uh, to show how beautiful India is. Um, <laughs> we trek to this place. Yeah, and how, what is the name? I, I couldn't recall. This is called um, Sedalu Malikarjuna Bettalupra. <laughs> Very near to our tribal land. Yeah. I took that. You, you, you need to apply one week uh, leave to uh, pronounce that name. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, what he said? <laughs> it um, means uh, uh, that the, it's a Shiva on the top which was hit by the lightning. <coughs> it happens uh, to that uh, Shiva and that's why the name given to them. Very near to our time, tribal ambulance and mm -hmm. we thought we would track it. Yeah. We did that. <coughs> and this is coming back down after a rainstorm. So this was the, the entrance at the foot of the hill before you climb up. And, uh. <laughs> and then here I am with a, and Professor uh, Shamsundar as well on the top with uh, several of the students at the, the top of that hill. That's all. Great.